How long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look? Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? On November 22, 1963, the day he was shot, John Kennedy lost a lot of things. He lost his beautiful wife. He left without saying goodbye to his lovely children. And although we don't think about it much, he lost the ability to have any effect on what the history books would say about him. Napoleon said that history books are written by the winners, but I don't think we really appreciate what that means. If I'm rich and powerful, and my thugs murder you and wipe out your family and all your friends and all of the witnesses, I am going to have much more to say about your history when it is written than you are. The killers get to write history, the victims get written about. And with his murder, John Kennedy lost the power to have any effect on what the history books would say about him. He became one of the losers who get written about. I wonder what he would say about his killers if he could speak. The car is now turning off to Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. It, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. There's numerous people running up the hill alongside Elm Street, there by the Simmons Freeway. Several police officers are rushing up the hill at this time. The most shocking thing about the assassination is not the brutality of it. It was brutal, certainly. But the most amazing thing is the way the established media today managed to pretend that there is any question about whether his murder was a conspiracy. We need to understand the images we've been looking at. This is Dealey Plaza, the scene of the crime. This is the school book depository building and the sixth floor window from which Oswald supposedly did his shooting. Abraham Zapruder was standing here with his home movie camera when he took the graphic pictures you just saw of the assassination, the Zapruder film. And this is the so-called grassy knoll. We'll talk more about that in a minute. The official government version of the murder, the Warren Commission report, found that Lee Harvey Oswald fired three shots from the sixth floor of the Dallas School Book Depository building. They tell us that the first shot missed, that the second shot hit both Kennedy and the governor of Texas, and the third shot from behind hit Kennedy in the head and killed him. But it's hard to watch the Zapruder film of Kennedy being thrown violently backward into the left and not think that he was shot from the front. This is Dr. Cyril Wecht. As the former head of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, he is the expert elected by the experts to represent them. If you have that kind of force slamming into the rear of somebody's head, then that should drive the individual forward. But instead, we have him moving backward and to the left. That suggests the very distinct possibility of another shot having been fired in synchronized fashion from the right side, the so-called grassy knoll area. But he's not the only one who thinks there was a shot fired from the grassy knoll. These people are standing in front of the grassy knoll and they are ducking because they heard a shot fired over their heads. The people you see running are running towards the grassy knoll heroically trying to catch the assassins. If Kennedy had actually been shot from behind, as the government says, he ought to have a small entrance wound on the back of his head. And this is the Navy doctor that the government got to write this report saying that Kennedy did have this small wound in the back of his head. But there are some things you should know about this guy. In a standard examination, he should have examined Kennedy's clothing for bullet holes. He didn't. In a standard autopsy, he should have dissected all of Kennedy's wounds to trace the bullet's path. He didn't dissect any of Kennedy's wounds. He didn't even realize Kennedy had a throat wound. He later claimed that these drawings of his were wrong and that the wounds were actually much higher. 
he lost Kennedy's brain, which is still missing, and then he burned his notes. He burned his notes. But perhaps we shouldn't be too hard on him, because this guy, Dr. James Humes, had never done an autopsy involving gunshot wounds before in his life. So naturally, he was the government's first choice to do the most important autopsy in American history. Dr. Hume's story about a small exit wound in the back of Kennedy's head is today the official government version. But this is not the story the New York Times told on the day Kennedy died. On the left in this picture, we see the New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Tom Weikert in Dallas outside Parkland Memorial Hospital. He spoke to the doctors who had been called to the emergency room to treat the president, and his story later appeared the same day on the front page. His article states, Later in the afternoon, Dr. Malcolm Perry and attending physician Dr. Kemp Clark, chief of neurosurgery at Parkland Hospital, gave more details. Mr. Kennedy was hit by a bullet in the throat just below the Adam's apple, they said. This wound had the appearance of a bullet's entry. Entry wounds on the front. Mr. Kennedy also had a massive gaping wound in the back and one on the right side of his head. The wound on the right was the entry for the shot from the grassy knoll. The wound in the back was the exit for that bullet that sent Kennedy's brains flying. Today the doctors are still unanimous in describing a large exit wound in the back of Kennedy's head. I was probably looking into a wound that was on the lateral or the side part of the head and the back part of the head. It would be this portion of the head right here. And as I remember, it's like this. That there was a big wound, big deficit in his skull and the temporal parietal area. If you listen carefully, you will even hear Walter Cronkite admit that the autopsy photos show this large hole in the back of Kennedy's head. The drawing was approved by Dr. McClellan, one of the attending physicians in Dallas. The drawing suggests what many of the photos examined by the doctors in Nova show, a large wound about this size and location. Now, if you're like me, you need to hear that eight or nine more times. The drawing suggests what many of the photos examined by the doctors in Nova show, a large wound about this size and location. There is really no room for debate on this point. Kennedy had a huge exit wound in the back of his head because the shot that killed him came from the front and could not have been fired by Oswald, who was behind the president. This information did not start off as a secret. It was made into a secret by constant authoritative denial of the truth. The lying continues today. Good evening, I'm Peter Jennings. Forty years after the assassination, the latest ABC News poll tells us that more than two-thirds of Americans still believe there was a conspiracy to kill the president. And Jennings thinks that he's the man to fix this problem, that two-thirds of the American people believe the conspiracy theories that say that the government is lying. What we will do tonight is demonstrate that those theories are wrong. Of course, he will have to lie to do that. This is Malcolm Kilduff, Kennedy's assistant press secretary. He is speaking at a press conference at the Dallas hospital where the president has just been pronounced dead. Please notice the ABC logo. This is from Jennings' video. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain. And they fade the scene out. No more press conference. But now watch this. The same guy, the same press conference, no ABC Hello, logo. Kennedy. He died at approximately 1 o'clock. Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot.